Isten, Isten. Uh, hold my drink. Um, hi, this is our St. Patrick's Day episode, so we celebrate alcohol problems, even though the patron saint of drunk cards is actually St. Martin, we celebrate him in November, and the Irish, despite the vicious stereotypes, don't even make the top 10 in drinking problems, because the most severely alcoholic nation in the whole wide world currently is, drum roll please, Hungary! rolling champions since I think 2017 or something. With over 21% of the adult population struggling with alcohol problems, my home country finally beat Belarus and even took Russia to it. So look at that map. Ain't it just, well, depressing? Importantly, the global top 10 in alcoholism numbers are almost exclusively European countries, so it might be time we address this. The most problematic drinkers are men uh, in, in most European societies. Pretty much connected to different kinds of gender roles and stereotypes about how men and women should behave. And, uh, you know, alcohol is a social lubricant. That there is responsibility on the family side, but there are varying responsibilities, right? I don't think it's, it should be about blaming anyone. For those who are traumatized, the children and the grandchildren as well has higher sensitivity to stress. I'm grinding my teeth as you're speaking. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the connectedness feeling, the attachment feeling, the emotional feeling is very similar uh, as an alcoholic has uh, with alcohol and with another person. So it, a subs it can be a substitute of a missing human relation. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a talk show with guests from all over Europe, and if there's anything we like to do in Europe, it's to drink like there's no tomorrow. I'm Reka Kinga Pop, editor-in-chief of Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show for Display Europe. Display is a new platform showcasing European content in 15 different languages. Check them out. Here on the show, we talk with authors, editors, experts, and artists about topics that affect and interest Europe. So, whether you are taped to a beer tap or a teetotaler, join us as we explore why Europeans, we have such a hard time holding our drink. And don't worry, this is an alcohol-free bitter that I just drank. Tastes identical, it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies and the satisfaction of cultivating some deeply ingrained cultural traditions, yet yeah, it requires way less aspirin afterwards. The numbers are clear, according to the World Health Organization, Europe has the highest proportion of drinkers and the highest intake of alcohol in the world. In 2019, 8.4% of the EU's population aged 15 or older consumed alcohol every day. That's severe. There is a range of factors that lead certain people or even certain populations to have alcohol issues, from biological and environmental to social and psychological. According to research conducted in 2011 at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, Europeans may be more genetically predisposed to eating fatty foods and consuming alcohol, and this is due to a quirk of what is called the Galenin gene. When switched on too strongly, it allows certain areas of our brain to select for specific substances, leading to cravings for alcohol and, well, fatty foods. But of course, we can't just blame one genetic variation here. Substance abuse is coded in many of our cultures. It constitutes about a third of our body of humor here in the East of Europe. Have you heard of my personal favorite, the TikTok star Balkan Dad? Tata, my throat hurts. Tata, my stomach hurts so bad. As much as we enjoy joking about how fond we Eastern Europeans are of our vodka, rakia, borovička, palika, schnapps and the like, Germans are similarly defined by their beer. Southern Europeans and the French with their day-to-day -day wine. Yeah, you know, you get the gist. Social drinking habits across Europe carry significant weight. But liquor is many things. It's part of our culture and often our identities. It's also an economic powerhouse and sometimes it's even currency. 
I should know, I spent my teenage years in the east of Hungary where the entire border region lived selling and buying Ukrainian vodka, cigarettes and petrol. Throughout the 90s and until Hungary joined the EU in 2003, people didn't even have to smuggle. Just the legal amount of drink you could bring into the country would sustain families with a couple of trips a month. The price differences were so staggering between the two countries and between regions. I used to bring Nyemirov and Stalishnaya on the train from my hometown to my university mates in Budapest and sell it for a quadruple price, which still counted as extremely cheap for them. And it arguably helped me save some of my student loans. I'm not proud of it, but man, I was poor. And the same classmates were never quite as interested in the nice jams and pickles I had to offer them. One study interestingly argues that it is not per capita consumption that counts the most, but rather the cultural beliefs surrounding it. Societies that hold positive beliefs around liquor, mainly defined as wet and Mediterranean, are less likely to face the same substance abuse problems as their so-called dry and Nordic counterparts. Owing to globalization and the homogenization of drinking cultures across Europe, this distinction seems less relevant over time though. The way we drink is changing and it's becoming noticeable with the new generation. And here comes some good news. Underage drinking has dropped significantly by 22% among youth in Europe. And while these numbers are far from perfect, their implications are promising. Public policies redefine social norms and newfound awareness of mental health are causing youth to stray further away from the drinking trend as 36% of Gen Z choose to go sober for psychological as well as financial reasons. Older Europeans, however, are less keen on switching over to tea and therapy. Even though EU prevention strategies are put forth to mitigate alcohol dependency and its social impacts, alcohol sales still sway our economic systems, affecting every aspect of our lives. Today we have three distinguished gentlemen and a lot of alcohol-free wine on the table to discuss this problem in greater depth. Peter Sharashi is a human rights activist and drug policy expert. He is the founder and editor of the Drug Reporter Project, created in 2004 to advocate for a drug policy reform in Central and Eastern Europe. István Certő is an English-Hungarian general translator and PhD student in social psychology, researching in the field of cognitive neuroscience. He is also an assistant lecturer at the Károly Gáspár University of the Reformed Church in Hungary. Dr. Máté Kapitány Fövény is a clinical psychologist with over 10 years of experience in the fields of therapeutic care and addiction research. He has written and published multiple books on addiction in the Hungarian language, including The Psychology of Alcoholism and A Thousand Phases of Addiction. We meet them in the leather workshop of Közben Studio in Budapest. Very welcome and thanks for taking the time to talk with me today about booze. Tell me about why you think alcoholism seems to be a bigger problem in Europe than the rest of the world, at least according to most statistics. Is this a cultural thing? Is this an economical thing? We just happen to be losers who have a specific gene variation. What's going on? I would address two uh, major questions here. First, the methodological part of it. So, based on which study uh, you have these estimates, uh, do you have direct estimates or indirect estimates? The WHO has an international study which can allow for a, a cross-cultural comparison. Uh, it is called World Mental Health Survey. And Australia, which is not part of Europe, is a very, very uh, top country. The cultural embeddedness of alcohol use uh, is much more inherent uh, in Europe. Many European countries can be categorized as an over-permissive culture. They attach values, certain values, to drinking itself. For example, manliness, which is a potential motive for youngsters uh, to drink more and more and more. If you studied relatively well, at least in my high school, you were like automatically uncool, unless you could drink as hell. The stats we cite here are cited directly from the World Population Review, but there's of course a lot of contrasting stats. Peter, how do you see Europe's relationship with alcohol as opposed to like sub generally substance abuse? We have this weird relationship where some things are legal, some things are encouraged even by the state, for instance, in the Hungarian case, and some things are illegal, whereas 
the harm factor often can be questioned. As far as I know, the alcohol use in general is in decline in Europe, so uh, for example among young people. But at the same time there are some varying trends as well, so like binge drinking, very short time getting drunk, uh, and that's very prevalent among, among especially young people. Even within Europe there are big differences in, in like uh, the how what are the cultural attitudes to drugs? There is also a gender, gender pattern in this. So uh, if you compare, for example, alcohol consumption among men and women, you will see a big difference. The most problem, problematic drinkers are men uh, in, in most European societies. Pretty much connected to different kinds of gender roles and stereotypes about how men and women should behave. And, uh, you know, alcohol is a social lubricant. It's a kind of laughing matter for many people. Like, you know, we, we used to make jokes about people who are problematic alcohol drinkers. And at the same time, I, I also see a kind of demonization of, of, of illegal drug use. So all those substances which are on the list of uh, controlled substances of the United Nations, which is alcohol, is of course, is not on this list. They entered Europe much later than alcohol. Uh, also like coffee or tobacco, which arrived later, but they are here for several centuries. If you look at the 20th century, there were these big tobacco advertisements everywhere. And they said that, you know, doctors recommend you to smoke tobacco, it's good for your health. After, after so many people died in, in the consequences of, of smoking, now societies become more restrictive to, to tobacco use. As I see, it's a kind of convergence in the attitudes to illicit and illicit drug use in our societies, so that, uh, that this, this gap in the perception is, 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 is getting smaller and smaller. For what it's worth, tobacco and coffee have a bit over 400 years of history in Europe. They are from different continents, of course, and have different trajectories, but that's quite a lot of time. However, you know, these are stimulants as opposed to alcohol, which is a depressant. You know, a good portion of, of illicit drugs don't necessarily increase productivity. And we tend to have a weird relationship with, uh, with productivity enhancements. I, I don't know how much that counts for in policy at this point. But maybe, uh, maybe Istvan, you want to tell about your experience. You teach a lot of young people. Do you sense this changing trend that we see in the statistics that young people tend to drink less? Yes, I think there is a general uh, tendency. I, I, um, I volunteer at a big festival. People there usually do not drink much. Mm -hmm. So it's not fashionable. Of course, that's just one festival and, and it's, very, it's, a, it's a subcultural festival, so it's very specific. Drinking is, how to say, actually it has no culture, so it has a long past and a long tradition. So there, there are drug-using subcultures, as far as I can judge. I get your point, that it's like it's not that unified uh, as a performance of drinking. I think it's less and less fashionable. I would add something that is related, but uh, not closely, is that uh, what Peter mentioned is uh, binge drinking. So it's not, not necessarily the regularity of alcohol consumption that counts on a cultural level or a country level, but uh, the pattern of use based on uh, per capita alcohol consumption rates. Hungary, for instance, is not on, uh, among the top level countries, but alcohol use disorder rates uh, of, of this country is quite high, meaning that we don't uh, drink as much uh, as, uh, as a country, as other countries, for example, uh, Latvia, Czech Republic, etc. But those who drink, drink a lot or, or without, uh, without culture. So uh, I think we need to you know, differentiate between regularity and pattern of use. Mediterranean countries usually have a high amount of uh, per capita alcohol consumption. These are called wet countries versus those uh, who are called uh, dry countries. But dry countries, sometimes they have higher alcohol related problems than wet countries. Okay. So it's, it also matters. What does this relate from or result from? Is this a cultural pattern? It, it is a cultural pattern. It is something that is related to the culture of siesta, uh, to the culture of drinking wine and not beer, and, not, and especially not, for example, palinka. I would argue that if we had institutionalized siesta, all substance abuse problems would just go lower because that just improves your quality of life Maybe, yes. instantly. One factor is, is like the different religious culture and tradition like this Mediterranean country has a Catholic 
uh, culture, while those Nordic countries, they have a Protestant culture and they have a different uh, kind of um, meaning for alcohol in everyday life. Max Weber wrote about this Protestant working ethics, you know, mm -hmm. like this, this kind of kind of a bit a bit puritanic world view that that you know that uh, that does not allow alcohol consumption especially not in excess uh, but when people kind of get out from the watching eyes of the authorities then they get drunk very very fast while in in in, in the mediterranean countries you can just drink a glass of wine with the dinner or with the, with the, with the lunch and that's completely normal so it's like the difference of social norms around alcohol consumption, I think. Protestant work ethic uh, is related to the stigmatization of alcohol because of something you already mentioned, productivity. So uh, if there is a substance that, that uh, have an adverse consequence on productivity, the society tends to stigmatize it uh, the, the most. Uh, for example, alcohol, for example, opioid use. And this is related to Protestant work ethics and capitalism itself and, and so on. Just to add to that, I think it was Bela Buda, a Hungarian addictologist, who said uh, that uh, there is the Nordic culture where people uh, drink uh, rarely, but a lot. And then there are the southern pattern where people tend to, to drink uh, more frequently, but less. And Hungary is the mixture of, of, of these two in the worst way. So it's like people tend to drink more frequently and more. And now a word from today's sponsor, Tomás Pince, who provided us with a selection of non-alcoholic beverages. Bittero is an alcohol-free herbal bitter made from 21 different medicinal herbs. And it is intended for those who do not want to consume alcohol for, well, whatever reason. Honestly, we sought them out ourselves to be a sponsor of the show because I personally have been a fan of their product. You can learn more about what they have to offer under tomashpinset.com and get your bitters under their web shop mylavendal.de. Thank you to Tomash Pince and let's get back to Talking Goose. Let's talk about how we react to alcohol problems. What would be sort of a quick first couple of steps for a completely lay person to understand about substance abuse? First, we need to destigmatize alcohol use disorder. That's the first and, and I think most important step. That's one. You need to demystify de uh, de de uh, therapeutic help, for example, psychotherapy as well, uh, in order to increase uh, uh, self-seeking behavior. You need to talk about the culture of, of drink, as you already mentioned. I think prevention is a key point here, because alcohol use disorder is always a secondary problem. Alcohol use disorder is something like a reaction to your primary problem. It can be anxiety, it can be depression, it can be trauma, etc. So need to address these questions in order to reduce later alcohol problems. I think it's very important what Matt has said about the stigmatization. Because in our society, you know, excessive drinking is sometimes, you know, idolized. But at the same time, if you have problems with alcohol, so if you are, you know, labeled as an addict, that, that carries a lot of stigma with it. It is also stigmatized in general in Hungarian society to, to ask for help. This kind of, this kind of stigmatization also uh, is a barrier to access to, to treatment. There was an article in Hungarian media which said that uh, one famous actor, Hungarian actor, he went to detox and he spent three months at detox. It's like a misconception, you know, that many people think that this is the kind of standard way how you can get rid of your alcohol uh, problems. Take it out of you. Yeah, it's like kind exorcism. of exorcism, yeah. yeah. Medic, a kind of medical exorcism. After this article, there was another article and they interviewed me and another uh, social worker and they corrected this picture. Yeah, but also if you think about rehab as this like completely isolated experience, the first thing that pops to mind is I can take three months out of life. I can't do that. So I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing until I topple over in the street or something, right? So that doesn't really sound realistic for most people who might have a drinking problem, but also have like pervasive obligations to just sustain themselves, a family or something. So I'm Istvan, you said you volunteer as a, at a festival and you meet people in various stages of life and intoxication. So what's your experience with them in a supportive situation? We cooperate with the ambulance 
and of course we don't do we, we don't uh, pursue any medical practices so we are there for them for those who are on a bad trip or for those who just feel alone or need some liquid intake water intake minerals so usually those festival visitors are quite well educated about the possible risks so you're the you substitute that one responsible friend that we all wish we had sometimes yes from what you're saying i take that your experience with these festival goers is that they might be better educated about what they're doing than our expectation would be how should we imagine this culture of substance use uh, there is i think there are local or, or different traditions subcultural traditions i guess so there are uh, different kinds of festival goers there are always uh, newcomers and uh, so of course they are uh, put at more much more uh, higher risk of some 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 adverse consequences than those who have more experience at this festival and the f- first one the first or second day of every festival uh, in each summer uh, someone comes to the site and uh, distributes some some kind of poison some kind of uh, designer drug and there are many cases so we are absolutely overloaded with uh, with cases and we we need to act as nurses basically at the, at the hospital so we need so they need a lot of help physical help but i think those who have more experience and know what where where to go for this and for that and what to avoid i think uh, they usually they can um, they can avoid what you know they are doing it's called harm reduction so like you know reducing the harms of uh, of substance use this problem about uh, drugs laced with different substances and uh, this kind of problems actually can be addressed through a program which is called drug checking service which already operates in many western european festivals people can go there they can uh, provide a very small sample of their their substance and then there is the equipment and they can tell you in mm. in a few minutes like what is in it exactly with this this you can avoid this kind of accidents or many of these kind of accidents uh, and unfortunately in hungary for example this kind of interventions are not uh, allowed i guess because for that you would need to acknowledge yeah exactly some, if not mm-hmm. the legitimacy at least sort of the interests of the user exactly and that's that's the i think that's the number one problem not only with illegal drugs but also illegal drugs that we don't want to recog- uh, we don't want to acknowledge that there is a problem if you acknowledge the problem then you have to do something about it so if you are responsible for a institution then you have to deal with it or when whenever we we try to go to for example prisons to do research we are usually <laughs> not allowed to do that because in the prison we don't have a problem how do you define alcohol problematic alcohol use Uh, our national statistical office defines it in a different way than wh- how the WHO defines it. Let's talk about a situation in in which you work with people who have already acknowledged that they have a problem and they're asking for help. And coming through the door, I said, "Oh, we have all these nice non-alcoholic drinks on the table," and you said, "Oh, I want <laughs> I want to point out those don't help. Tell me about this. Tell me about these triggers, the situation in which people ask for help." what are the first couple of steps to make sure that they have an environment where they can heal or process so we are talking about alcohol and we have a table full of alcohol like uh, alcohol looking things alcohol. none of them are alcoholic uh, but this my point is it can be a trigger yeah. it can be a trigger for those who have alcohol related problems so i would say this kind of uh, uh, alcohol free uh, drinks is not a, not a solution for the greater problem The solution uh, from an individual level, and yes, we treat alcohol use with other patients as well at our outpatient center, is to understand the individual, understand his or her motives to drink. And for example, when we talk about alcohol use motives, um, a psychologist called Lynn Cooper uh, categorized four different uh, drinking motives. The first one is conformity motive, meaning I drink alcohol because I perceive a social norm. The second one is called social motive. For example, the ancient Greek term symposium or symposium uh, means drinking together. Uh, connectedness itself is the point here, not usually uh, the alcohol. Alcohol is just you know, the context. Um, 
The third one is called enhancement motif, meaning I have a good feeling. For example, I go to the party, uh, I have great feelings and I, I want to enhance these feelings. And the most problematic one is called coping, the coping motif, meaning I have inner problems and I use alcohol um, as a tool, as an instrument to reduce these problems. And usually so, uh, this kind of coping motif leads to later alcohol use disorder uh, problem. Also, you need to understand uh, his or her background the family background, uh, his or her experiences, his expectations about alcohol itself. And most importantly, you need to um, assess the patient's uh, social environment. Addicts and alcohol use disorder patients as well are usually very, very much isolated. So psychotherapy, uh, by creating an attachment, a bridge between two persons, can itself uh, help. But, uh, but community, for example, self-support groups, etc., can, can also provide uh, further support. Yeah, so I, I would think by the first looks of it, and I don't want to stick with these nice drinks that we put on, uh, put on the table, but this allows you to sort of substitute something. But you argue that substitution in and of itself is not a good solution for those who already have a problem, right? Uh, when we are talking about a safe environment or a trusting environment, what would be the primarily, primary role of family and friends and what would be more the responsibility of society and policy? As far as I know, uh, when there is an alcoholic in the family, the families are usually very heavily and deeply involved uh, in the problem itself. So it's not confined to the one person who has the disorder themselves but their whole families so there is a more functioning family which is either the cause or and or and the consequence of um, uh, the problem that leads to substance use disorder yeah so the addict is not like independently struggling with a problem he's not from independent their yeah in, in this sense yes at least somehow they participate in the disorder I, I think so they do not just they are not just uh, they, they they are not solely victims of um, the abuser, but somehow they maintain the disorder itself. For example, there's shame about it. They feel ashamed because there is someone in the family who cannot control themselves. So then I think they, they um, participate in covering up. It's, it's not just about alcohol, it's any kind of abuse, I, I guess. So I guess that there is a very, uh, there is a very close-knit unity in this, in many cases. And I think that's uh, the, maybe the reason is very similar why many abused women uh, choose not to, to ask for help. Like this regime of shame going around. Oh yes, it's, 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 one, it's one dimension, I think, or one, one factor in this. Uh. Yeah, so, so often the family hides the person in, in need as, as uh, very similarly the, uh, than the person hides alcohol itself from the environment. So, and the shame itself, just as isolation, is a major uh, feeling of all the addicts, all the addicts. And all, I would say all the addict comes from a dysfunctional family and not necessarily from an alcoholic family, but some dysfunction is there. In family therapy, we called the alcohol use disorder patient as a symptom carrier. He or she carries the symptom of a broader system, which is the family, which is the society, etc. So individual level approach is usually not, not, uh, not enough. We need to combine it with family therapy, with, with community therapy, etc. So, which means I think that the disorder and the problem should be acknowledged by all those who are um, yes. directly uh, involved in the problem. There could be a distinction that the families do participate in it, but, but we don't blame, say, children with alcoholic parents for their parents' problems, right? So we could maybe clarify this, that that there is responsibility on the family side, but there are varying responsibilities, right? I don't think it's, it should be about blaming anyone. In a country where it's a common joke that daddy drinks because you're crying, it might be mm. worth pointing this point out. I don't know. I would say we, we can talk about two different uh, things. The first one is the background of the alcohol use disorder patient. Uh, for example, from his own childhood memories. So it's like a transgenerational uh, repeat, repeatedness here. So uh, what we call dysfunctional family is usually the childhood uh, family and not the family in which he or she acts like an abuser. Yeah, yeah. That's important. Too. And sometimes it's not even abuser, just the experience of having someone struggle with alcohol. They don't need to hit you. And it's, uh, of course, also important to point out that not all 
people struggling with addiction hit anyone. And likewise, most abuses cannot be blamed on alcohol solely. But Peter, you have been waiting to come in for a long time. So. I just wanted to add that everybody re remembers the petty prince, the little prince, when there is the planet of the alcoholic. And, uh, uh, and he asked him, like, why do you drink? Because I, I'm ashamed of myself. And why are you ashamed of my, yourself? Because I drink. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of spiral, you know, of spiral of shame and addiction. As Mati mentioned, many times these, these behavior patterns are transgenerationally inherited. Addiction is a very humane thing, actually. I think it's, it's uh, of course, it's sometimes called as a disease, but actually if you really understand it, then you will understand that these are very human, human, human reactions. Viktor Frank also said that those who cannot find deep meaning in life will seek uh, joy itself or euphoria itself. And I think it's also true for all the addicts. I cannot find a deep meaning in my life. So that's why uh, I self-stimulate myself and maintain uh, a very self-stimulated phase in which I, cannot, I, I don't have to uh, think about anything else. It's not even only about humans, we are very social animals, but uh, there is a very interesting uh, experiment about uh, uh, fruit flies. They examined the fruit flies, alcohol consumption among fruit flies, they made, made alcohol available for them. And, and those fruit fl male fruit flies who were socially rejected by females, they drank exponentially more than... See? <laughs> women are the reason for all of this. That's not the conclusion. And that's not, not the moral of the story, but the, the moral of the story is that social rejection and social isolation, it can very seriously uh, influence your drug use patterns, whatever legal or illegal substance we are speaking uh, about. And uh, neurobiological studies, uh, you know, confirmed that once you, you, you crave the other person, you are lonely, very similar uh, neurobiological actions happen than when you crave a substance. So the, the connectedness feeling, the attachment feeling, the emotional feeling is very similar uh, as an alcoholic has uh, with alcohol and with another person. So it, it can be a substitute of a missing human relation. Now a word from today's host, Közben Studio, here in Budapest. It is a community workshop, office and art space established in 2019. And since then it has hosted numerous exhibitions, concerts and workshops and over the years has evolved into an unconventional co-working space. Currently there are two leather ornament designers, a jeweler, an architect, a photographer, an animator, two graphic artists, a web designer <gasps> and even a web developer working here. And sometimes even I crash a desk. You can also become a supporter of the show and you don't even have to get me jewelry. I mean, you can, of course, if you want to. But it may be a bit more straightforward if you pledge your support at patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford and I promise we won't buy leather clutches and earrings from it. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the tapings of the show, and you even get to submit topics and questions. Now back to the program. There's a lot of talk, not often very clearly, about what is the legacy of the Eastern Bloc and Soviet experiment, communism, whatever you want to call it, when it comes to alcoholism. People would be put in jail directly for being drunkards. And on the other hand, it seems to have produced a lot of alcohol problems. And Honkish argues that this was probably a result of rapid urbanization and industrial work being introduced and kind of communities falling apart. Does this argument stand its ground, do you think? Is there merit there? It is not only Honkish uh, theory, but also Ulrich Beck theory, who published his book uh, titled Risk Societies. Uh, and Basically, he wrote the same about industrialization, about about you know like the, the falling apart of communities, of families, uh, of being this productive fetish. In those countries who suffer multiple trauma historically, and for example, Eastern Europe, the so uh, yeah, Soviet Union, uh, you know, countries, post-Soviet post Union countries have multiple historical trauma. These cultures tend or are more more prone to become over permissive of of something like alcohol consumption, something like uncontrolled behavioral. So again, over-permissive cultures have the highest uh, alcohol use problems as well. 
Yeah, I think it's it's not accidental that there is a dif still a difference uh, among societies which are equally highly industrialized. So I, I also believe that in Hungary, for example, this very high levels of uh, problems related to alcohol compared to other countries. It also it also has something to do with our history. It also has something to do with how our society is uh, is built. We, we, know, we, we all know families where it was a taboo to speak about the grandfather's experiences in the war or the Holocaust or uh, if he was imprisoned in, yeah. some, in some regimes. And there is yeah, a, by the way, your grandfather was a prisoner of war but never told us a word about this. Addiction expert in anger, Dr. Uh, Laszlo Levendel, and he said that uh, in, in, in this socialist or state socialist society in Hungary, this unresolved trauma and uh, and, and, and lack of freedom in general, and this, this culture of silence, it produced two reactions from society. One is that uh, Hungarians tend to hate the other and the minorities and just hate hating each other. That's very much a reaction. And the I other is to grumble. That's the other sure. is the, the alcohol, uh, the uh, <laughs> increase in alcohol use, which was, I think, the worst in uh, 70s and 80s in Hungary and uh, and also in the 90s and then it 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 it, it now is, is declining. So the worst period of of alcohol use was was back in the in in the period between the 56 revolution and the changes of the political changes. Yes. Yeah, like if you just look on a historical scale, there's like two world wars and this incredibly traumatic like rebuilding and then and then uh, strengthening oppression within one generation. So the 50s in and of themselves weren't a, key, a piece of cake. So all of this compounded pretty much, you know, predisposes to have, have to look for coping mechanisms in a society that doesn't really offer them on a silver platter. It's very important to understand that the trauma is not the bad thing that happened, but how it changed the person and the, and the communities. And, and not to speak about what the bad things that happened, that is really traumatic. And in itself, if, if there is something bad happening in a society, but it is like resolved and uh, discussed and we are open about it and we speak about it, whether we speak about one single family or the whole society, I think it, 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 it's, it, it does not necessarily become a historic trauma. And I think you also need to understand what trauma does to the person itself, not just on a, on a society level, because trauma increase uh, or uh, create hypersensitivity to stress itself. And also trauma has epigenetic effect as well, so a transgenerational uh, epigenetic effect, meaning that, for example, those who are traumatized, the children and the grandchildren as well, has higher sensitivity to stress. I'm grinding my teeth as you're speaking. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and if you have hypersensitivity to stress, you are more prone to addiction as well. Yeah. And you will try to compensate with what society offers you. And if society offers you porn, video game or alcohol, you will have this as a, as a potential maladaptive tool. What you said about industrialization and globalization, that if, if, you, if you look at any kind of drugs, they had some kind of traditional use. Like if you look at how tobacco was used in traditional Amazonian societies, you know, it was like a, made, they made a liquid out of it. Uh, or if you, if you look at opi opium, you know, like in China for thousands of years, it was, it was a medicine and it was very much embedded in the cultural uh, norms and it, it didn't become a problem until the Portuguese came, uh, they mixed opium with tobacco, they sold it in a pipe. What, what I believe is that our societies don't have a drug problem or alcohol problem. We, we have a general problem with consumption, with how we are related to pleasure, how we seek pleasure, how we forgot how to find meaning in our lives. So that's that's the real problem and, and that's why I Personally, I don't like this kind of, you know, uh, fight against drugs or fight against alcohol or whatever kind of campaigns or, uh, or, or policies, because I don't think the problem is with the molecule. It's not the problem with the substance. What the problem is with, with us, <laughs> with people, how, how, we, how we live. Also, it doesn't help that these dr wars and drugs don't seem to work either. So the, even if it were just a, were just a fallacy on a conceptual level, they also don't perform. 
And of course, it's, it's also a question of what we call drugs and how they evolved. All, all these kind of pure, highly potential versions of drugs, these are the products of, of our technical civilization. Uh, cocaine, you know, like <laughs> coca leaves, they were like chewed by uh, Amazonian people for, and, and the people in the Andes for, for a thousand years without much social and health problems. Across much of you know, the Northern Hemisphere, well, not much, but a significant portion, have started to legalize weed in some capacity or other formerly illegal drugs. Does this like circle of shame change? We know that many mental health professionals, uh, medical professionals have been arguing for the controlled or supported use of certain substances, specifically as a therapeutic mean means. I feel like the stigma uh, regarding certain substances uh, is slightly reducing. So everybody is happier in Czechia? Uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, you need to differentiate again between legalization and decriminalization, which is two different uh, things. If the outcome is, uh, is the uh, dissolve, dissolvation of, of, uh, of hidden uh, use, I think it is a benefit. Uh, if the outcome is reducing stigma, it's a benefit. Uh, and there are some studies uh, that confirm that decriminalizing a substance uh, make it more easier on a society level to talk about it. So when you talk about, for example, with youngsters about alcohol consumption, they need to know the exact level of, of alcohol intake that it is preferable to them, for example. Yeah. Peter, you've been campaigning for people to know a bit more about drugs and maybe have a, a better informed policy for decades now. Yeah, I think legalization is, itself is a very loaded term, so it can mean many things to many people. So uh, I rather use the term regulation, and I think the real question is how to regulate the substances. You can also do, you can, you can make very bad and ineffective regulations, and you can make good, good regulations. So the how is now the real question of our age, how to regulate these substances. Um, I believe that the future is that the, the prohibition of, for example, cannabis will just uh, cease in many, or it will be abolished in many countries. Uh, and uh, as we see in North America or in Western Europe, uh, there will be some kind of schemes how to make a legal access, how to create legal access to these drugs. Don't make the same mistakes as we did with alcohol or tobacco in the 20th century or in some countries like Hungary even now. So we need to get somewhere in the middle uh, and we have to maximize the public health benefits and minimize the harms. We should avoid the full commercialization of these products because that we know from the case of tobacco, for example, that it can create a lot of uh, public health harms. So we, if, we, if we create a legal industry, uh, it will be a lobby force. Matt, is there something um specifically regarding alcohol, where you would argue that regulation should change? In case of alcohol, what we would need, I think, is uh, environmental prevention, meaning you, you try to change the attitude of the society towards alcohol consumption, reduce the size of bottles or glasses uh, in pubs, for example, form of like a harm reduction, but also an environmental prevention. A workforce uh, in Europe called the European Framework for Action on Alcohol uh, that have this aim to reduce uh, per capita alcohol consumption uh, by 10 percentages at the end of 2025, I think. And there are many, many, you know, like approaches they offer there. For example, the avail availability, uh, the minimum age restrictedness of, of alcohol consumption, labeling uh, bottles of, of, uh, of alcohol, etc. And there is a very important point there, uh, the community based approaches, how to strengthen, empower communities to, to become as, as one, how to increase solidarity level and so on, uh, which is, I think, it's uh, one of the key points. It's, I think it's very, very important what Mate is saying about environmental prevention, because in the past we tend to uh, think about this, you know, like we focus on the individual always in the individual. In prevention, you have to convince the individual not to use drugs, or, uh, in, and then you, you, you have to deal with individuals in the treatment system and everything. And uh, 
the new approach is, is an environmental approach. So you have to change the environments in which people, uh, in people make decisions about their health. When we speak about these drug policies, we should not only speak about laws and uh, how we punish the individual or how we make, get, get the individual into the treatment system, but how we are redesigning our uh, cities, urban environments, and we, how, how we get rid of this aggressive alcohol, mm, PR or propaganda or marketing, wherever, wherever you go in public. So it's like there are a lot of things to change. So beyond this legalization prohibition debate, there are a lot of things to change in our culture and in our society. I think the solution is going to be if you make it cool to instead of having a drink, just chum down on some pickles because I have a lot to sell. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>